This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and here's our second episode of Five Minutes on Tech. A lot just happened at CES 2017. We couldn't fit it all in in the first episode, so we're going to pick up here with some of the neatest tech that I think came out that applies to all the kind of stuff that we review, and a few things that don't because I think they're just really worth mentioning. We're going to talk about them now. First up, we didn't mention it last time, but now it's official. The Dell XPS 15 has finally gotten a refresh. Intel KB Lake 7th generation CPUs, and more importantly, because that's not a big performance jump, we finally get NVIDIA Pascal 10 series graphics. So NVIDIA GTX 1050. It's, you could call the XPS 15 really an, an intro level serious gaming laptop at this point. The only thing that remains to be seen is how is this going to handle the heat because that's uh, got probably going to be a pretty toasty GPU in there and the previous XPS 15 got reasonably warm with the, the G, GTX 960 in it. But anyway, performance, wow. And the same thin light shell, nothing is going to change there in terms of the looks, the same keyboard, the same soft touch interior, classy aluminum exterior, very lightweight couple different resolution options. Excited to see this coming and we will be reviewing it. We reviewed the latest refresh of the HP Spectre X360 13 inch very recently, about a month or so ago, but there wasn't a refresh of the 15 inch at that point. Well, now it's official and HP has announced the Spectre X360 15 inch with that same redesign that has just about no bezels on the side. Near bezel-less design, the top and the bottom, pretty decent sized bezel, but thinner, lighter, about 4.4 pounds, so that's under two kilograms for your metric folks there. The more interesting thing here is that the pen, the active digitizer, is back. It disappeared for the 13 inch. We were really sad to see it go, but here it's, the pen is actually in the box included with 4,000 levels of pressure sensitivity. So for you art folks who want to live a little bit large, it's a dual core CPU inside. So is your Ultrabook CPU. It's still got enough to run Photoshop fine. And you can get it with low level NVIDIA 940 MX graphics there, which is certainly better than dedicated integrated graphics, but you know, it's not a gaming GPU or anything like that. That's going to be available in February on HP's website. You can pre-order it on Best Buy right now. They have the $1,500 configuration, pretty high-end, i7, 512 gig SSD, 16 gigs of RAM, and a 4K display as standard. Right now, there is no 1080p option. And of course, it's a touchscreen too. Next, the home. Of course, the Internet of Things, the home is getting automated. Well, even Griffin, who's a really well-known accessory maker for iThings, for the Mac, for the iPhone, for the iPad, all that sort of thing, they're making a connected coffee maker and a connected toaster. That's right, they use Bluetooth, so you can control your coffee maker and set how strong your coffee is, how many cups you're brewing, all that sort of thing, how dark or light you like your toaster, your toast, whether it's gluten-free. It's, it's it's really, it's an interesting step when some company like Griffin actually starts doing this. And the prices are going to be pretty good too, 99 bucks, which is sort of like what you pay for a Cuisinart coffee maker or a fancy pants toaster. Anyway, uh, it'd be interesting to see. Tell me in the comments, do you really think that there's a need for, you know, using your phone to control your toaster or your coffee maker, that sort of thing. More interesting though, is there connected mirror? It's $999, so obviously this isn't going to be something most of us buy, but it's a glimpse into the future, pun intended. It's a mirror that's going to show you information up in the corner so you can see the temperature, the latest news, whatever it is you want synced from your smartphone or tablet. Honestly, for $1,000, I think it should have its own little CPU inside and be pulling data directly and not using your phone. Maybe they just think it's easier for you to not have to set up two devices instead of one. But I suspect 10 years from now that... Homes are going to have these things, and they're going to be under $100, so it's a glimpse of the future. There hasn't been much about phones at CES, and often there isn't. They choose their own events to roll out new phones, but Huawei has been trying very hard to break into the U.S. market, and they've done a good job with some of the Honor phones that we've reviewed. Well, their first high-end phone, the Mate 9, is officially coming to the U.S. at Best Buy, Newegg, Amazon, all those places. It's going to be tough, though. It's an unlocked GSM phone, so T-Mobile, AT&T, not Sprint, not Verizon. But it's going to be tough because it's $600, $599, and I don't think a lot of you are going to pay that much money for a non-carrier branded phone. It's just the way the U.S. market is. But 5.9-inch display, their own Kirin multi-core processor, which is a very capable processor, dual camera design, and it's been a good camera so far, 4,000 milliamp battery. So it's got a lot to like, and most interestingly is they designed it to put Amazon's Alexa in there, which is the home automation assistant. And Alexa is great at home automation kinds of things, but not so much controlling your smartphone. So it's kind of weird. You already do have the Google Assistant built in there. I mean, you don't usually tell Alexa to send a text message or set your alarm or something like that. So I think they're doing it for the, the brand awareness more than anything else. It'll be interesting to see how many people actually use that feature on the phone. 
Notebook 9, you know, we really actually like these a lot. These are their crazy light two pound Ultrabooks with full core i5 and i7 CPUs inside. They got a refresh and I'm on the fence about this because I love their iconic kind of teardrop design that they used to have the, the little curve where the ports are wider and it tapers on the, toward the front. It was a very Samsung look and it was very attractive. Maybe they just thought they've been rolling that for too long. I don't know. These get a more traditional design, you, you know, squared off but rounded edges, that sort of thing. And what you get for the price is still pretty nice, a 999 starting price for the 13 inch with a Core i5, 8 gigs of RAM and a 256 gig SSD. And you can get it with a, an i7 too for $200 more and 16 gigs of RAM. And then there's a 15 inch model, it's e which is even available with, again, NVIDIA 940MX graphics. That's the graphics chip that gets thrown in every dual core laptop if they're going to try to jazz it up. Yeah, you know, and that goes up to $13.99 if you go for that option, or you can get it for a few hundred bucks less. We're going to review this. We're going to find out. They did some body change design here. We're going to see how much the keyboard flexes and other things, but still, one thing that's going to be amazing is they still will be magnesium alloy and around two pounds for weight. Samsung once made gaming notebooks, and everybody really liked them, reviewers and buyers way back several years ago, and then, well, they stopped. Of course, they almost left the laptop market. You know what they're trying again now? They have the Samsung Odyssey gaming notebooks in 15 and 17 inches. They haven't said everything about these. They have prototypes out for us to see, but... Um, they look like every other gaming laptop. So they're they're black, they got lots of red accents, they got your, your multicolor keyboard, not individual keys, but zone keyboard backlighting. And their last gaming laptop had this sort of classy look. Samsung has a way of bringing class to their high-end laptops. They weren't focusing on that here. So this is not going to be a razor blade competitor. This is more going to go up against the Acer Predator, the MSI Dominator kind of line, that sort of thing. The 15 inch is not, you know, well, it's more like HP Omen level, but not, that hasn't got real cojones. NVIDIA GTX 1050 inside. So that's the, the lower end. That's the same thing we see in the Dell XPS 15, lower end of gaming laptops, but still it should be pretty capable. 1080p display, of course, quad core CPU, KB like these are both gonna have 15 and 17 inch. The 17 inch model, they have not said what the GPU is gonna be in there. So that's interesting. Or if they're still trying to stuff the most powerful thing they can get in there without having the thing just absolutely melt down. Only 1080p screens, once again, that non-touch as your options there. And again, the multicolor, multi-zone backlight keyboard is gonna be standard on those. Thunderbolt 3 port on the 17 inch. In not on the 15 inch though. And on a totally different yet related note, there are Samsung Chromebooks that are actually worth looking at if you don't mind spending around $450. But these are nicer than your average Chromebooks. There's a Chromebook Plus and Pro models. These are convertibles with an active pen. Remember, Samsung owns, what is it, 20% of Wacom now? So they, they like to put those Wacom pens in things. QHD display. I mean, these are nice specs for a Chromebook. So that $450 is not that badly spent if you like well, Chrome OS and it's kind of limited functionality compared to something that can run standalone executables. The Plus runs on an ARM CPU, the Pro runs on an Intel Core M3. That's the difference between those, otherwise they have the same feature set. Last mention, Dell Canvas 27 inch. And now this one kind of came out in left field. This is not a standalone PC, it's not Surface Studio. I know some of you might see it and think it is. It has something like the Surface Dial they call the Totem, and it, but it only works when you put it on the screen. Anyway, it is a, it's, it's a Wacom Cintiq 27 QHD, basically. So that means it's not a PC on its own. You plug it into a PC and it becomes a touchscreen with 20 point multi-touch. So I guess that means collaboration, unless you're gonna use your fingers and toes is a possibility. And it supports an active pen. So again, it's, this, is, this is gonna be a little bit iffy and dubious because it's gonna be priced at $1,800, $1,799, which is cheaper than the Wacom Cintiq 27 QHD, but that's around 22 to 2,500 bucks. But Wacom really has locked in the professional creative crowd, the folks who are doing graphics design and illustration, game development assets, that sort of thing. And I'm not sure the pen experience is going to be as good on the Dell that's going to get that full Wacom experience there. So this is a group of people who are probably saving $500 doesn't matter so much if you're using a 27-inch professional display to draw on. But they're trying.